Well, I've always perceived myself as an artist. I, I have no memory of not being into art. I wasn't sure what it would be like in New York, but I knew it would be really hard. So I, I tried to become the most competent artist I could possibly be. Art is like this magic passport. It's got, I've got to go to almost every country in the world through my art. I've got to meet the most incredible people in the world through my art. I've never met somebody that was a fan of my art that I didn't like and that I didn't want to be friends with. And that means I'm doing something right. Yeah, this is a real big deal for me. This is sort of the kind of thing, like I've wanted this to happen and be associated with a company like this since the beginning. I am basically somebody who's been in the art world since before you were born, and whatever movement happened, I was there first. I grew up in uh, Decatur, Illinois, and it's a small, isolated town. It, it, I don't even believe they have an airport at this point, so um, I knew less than nothing about art. Um, the only art that I knew of is um, we showed art at the malls. My aunt was a was an artist, and, and uh, so she would ex do exhibitions at the mall with other artists. And the avant-garde artist were like on this side, and then the, the normal artists were on this side. So a normal artist would paint flowers, but the avant-garde people would paint barns. And that was my whole world. <laughs> well, eventually I, I left Illinois with no intention of going to college or anything. Um, I just didn't want to work in the factories in Decatur, Illinois, so I went down south to find work. And, um, but eventually I went to college and learned more about art. Well, I, I, did, I did choose as my main practice photography, but it, what I was thinking at the time, and it's always funny to go back and think about what you were thinking, because usually it's not right. But um, I thought painting had been around a long time and probably everything that could be done with painting had, be done, could, had already been done. And since photography was only 100 years old or so, I thought the possibility of me of coming up with something completely unique would be more, more, more of a probability than, than using a medium that's been around for thousands of years. I mean, obviously, there was much more to be done with painting, and, but at that moment, that's what I was thinking. And I came up with a, a, an art form where I created things in the environment and I reversed perspectives and, and I made um, elaborate cardboard drawings of people that were photorealistic so they seemed real in the picture but I also could make like the head of my grandmother like gigantic and her body small and then I could stretch out her hand so I could make it appear if she's sitting at a table but somehow somebody's reaching in front of her face and they're only like two inches tall but then they're really there in the background so it was a lot of perspective tricks. But in the meanwhile, like maybe I, I liked a certain location out, outdoors and, and in the background there would be billboards and the billboard said, you know, drink Budweiser or drink Coca-Cola. And, th and I, that didn't really relate to like what I was doing in the foreground. I couldn't just later doctor the, the billboards. They were t in the composition, so that meant I had to go repaint the billboards. So I did a lot of prep work before I did the photos, but yeah, everything was really happening in the photos. So when I'm running around Dallas doing a lot of photographs, doing, every week I'm doing a different photograph, and, and the residual is there's this weirdly painted billboard, and it wasn't something that I was thinking about. But um, a there were a lot of young painters in Dallas um, that would see the billboards. And then finally, um, it was Jeff Robinson that approached me and he goes, could I do billboards too? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm just stealing the billboards. It's not like um, you could do it too. And he goes, yeah, I, I know you're stealing them, but I just thought out of respect, you know. And so then we formed a group of a bunch of artists called the New Urban Aesthetics Committee. And we named the art Vandal Art. And I named myself Randall Hart because it sounded like Vandal Art. So that w I was like the Banksy of that period and had a, a fake name and nobody knew who I was. And we would go from city to city and do these huge events where we would just take over like whole neighborhoods with the billboards. All, all my billboards were related to my weird surrealist art um, in the beginning. And then uh, when I, I lived in Austin, I lived at a house full of political activists. So they were all in Earth First and they were very socially minded. There was, I think when you walked in the house, there was a sign that said social responsibility. And, you know, I was kind of just a party kid, so I was just kind of like, what's social responsibility? And they're like, oh. Um, but they, they were intrigued with the fact that I was always on the news. I mean, I wasn't on the news as me, I was on the news as Randall Hart, but there was, this Randall Hart kid was always doing crazy stuff around Texas and, you know, getting a lot of attention. And, and, and I had direct access to the public, even if the news didn't want to cover it. If you put a billboard on a highway in Houston, thousands of people are going to see it. 
And so they're trying to get messaging out. And so they were like, we don't understand. I mean, it's great that you put your art out there for free for everybody, but uh, you know, what if you had like a social message in it? So they kind of encouraged me to take a little more of a political stand and, and use it as, as a form of political activism more than a, a place to display my art. I, I, I got a graduate degree. Um, I really wanted to be the best. I thought, I wasn't sure what it would be like in New York, but I knew it would be really hard. So I, I tried to become the most competent artist I could possibly be, and I went to graduate school. And uh, so when I graduated, I, I was painting the billboards on paper and then pasting them up. So I, I rolled into New York with, I think, uh, 11 billboards all rolled up in one bundle. And when I was in graduate school, I knew I was going to move to New York in, in June when I graduated, but I went there on my spring break and I rented an apartment because I just thought then I'll have an apartment straight to go to and I won't have to be looking for an apartment with all my stuff or whatever. And, and of course my sister realized, wow, you just rented an apartment in New York. I'm going to New York, I'm going to live there. You're just going to let this sit there for two months or two and a half months? It's like I'm going to go live there. And she's a wild kid, you know. Um, so by the time I got there, she had already taken up graffiti and come up with images that she was putting on the streets. And I think she'd already even was in, in a book, <laughs> you know. But yeah, she was like rolling around with Keith Haring and Kenny Powell and uh, 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 Ricky Powell. And yeah, she just fell right in with that crowd. Yeah, and she was like, yeah. Well, she, had, she was funny because she was like, and, and I was gonna be married to Keith Haring by the time you got there, you know. I was just gonna surprise you, you know, because he really, I liked Keith a lot. But uh, he was a really, really, really smart, person. Like I always kind of thought of him as like the the mayor. Like usually you have the real mayor of a town and then you have the the, the mayor who knows everybody, puts everybody together and, and I don't know. He, he, he felt like the mayor, the mayor of graffiti town or something. Street art, you know, we, there was some street art in the 80s and then it kind of faded out and I continued doing the billboards and the street art and then it was there was like in the early 90s there was just literally nobody you know doing it and then then Shepard Ferry came along and then he was one of the first people I met who was like starting to do this again. And then it, it actually, by the end of the, uh, like about 2000, it was actually a big thing and uh, a lot of people writing about it. So they were, they were trying to find who, who would have been the first. I don't even know who named street art. You know, I, I, nobody's ever stepped forward and said, I'm the, I'm the art critic that, that gave it the name street art. Because I think I would called it vandal art for like all the 80s. But uh, yeah, so I don't know who donned me the, the godfather of street art, but, but a lot of the press took, took that up and, and, uh, and it kind of helped me a lot because, you know, I don't know, I, I ended up getting all the stuff in China because the, the promoter there goes, you know, I, I, he, he picked Ventura because he's the godfather of graffiti and then I, I like the godfathers, you know, and I like the people that get thought of that way, you know. I try to act more like a grown-up now, you know, so instead of being like like an outlaw, I try to be more of an in-law, you know, because, you know, I'm in my 60s, so it is weird that I still do, like, teenage prank stuff, but, uh, but, but for the most part, I try to, I'm really trying to be a part of society <laughs> and not be an outlaw, but it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, when you, I work with a lot of big companies, and, uh, you know, it's actually very restrictive of what people will tolerate you doing or saying, just with all these restrictions, sometimes it's nice just to go out and just steal a billboard and say what I, I want to say. Um, I originally conceived of uh, Guernica because, again, you know, I also have this parallel career in music, and I was kind of intrigued by um, the fact that in, in music, or traditionally in music, like in folk music, there was a melody, and, and that you would just take somebody else's melody and then you would add new words to it to be relevant to your times. But it, what, people weren't like, oh my God, you stole that melody. They would just, oh, of course he took the melody, you know, and he made new words to it and made it relevant. And so the, the, um, the Guernica was kind of, I used the same way, like it's a melody um, that I can add new words to to make it more relevant today. And uh, the, the melody's familiar, and also you have the, the underlying concept of Guernica is everybody understands that. That's like a universal. You probably find very few people in the world that don't know that's Guernica. They bombed a town that was unarmed um, just to try out some bombs and it's, we understand what that means. And so if, if, it's, if something's put together in that composition that we know that that's part of that dialogue and that's part of the story he's telling and it, it's, it, it's, it's easy to understand that part. So I've accomplished that half of the story and then you have to sort out what the other half of the story is. But I'm already, I've already got halfway there just by 
using the, the, the staging of Guernica. Well, I'm very um, interested in like intellectual challenges. So um, with Guernica, you know, it was pretty easy to come up with the ten, first 10 concepts to couple with Guernica. And then it was a little harder with the number 11 and even harder with 21. And by the time you're like on 90, it's, it's then it becomes a very big challenge to come up with something unique and new. And I love that challenge of like when somebody goes, well, there's, you could not possibly come up with another iteration of this. Hold my beer, <laughs> you know, but I love the intellectual challenge, you know. Well, the Star Wars piece, I was using uh, a piece of popular culture, Star Wars, which um, for a lot of people of my generation, it's almost like a biblical thing. It, it means as much as the Bible did to the generation before us because it's telling these archetypal stories, but in a way that's um, modern, not only modern, but also kind of forward thinking, like how are we gonna you know, have the ways we see the world and the societies and the tropes like exist as we kind of advance into the universe. And then the delusional one is, a, you know, of course I had to do one with my characters, so. Well, I made punk because I needed the weed smoking character. Because a lot of people are really into weed and I don't know, I just thought, I try to, now I'm trying to be a little bit more inclusive and in, in adding more and more characters. At this point I have uh, 200 characters, but uh, Punk Sunk really has legs. People really like him and people really like Elefanka. So there's a few characters that are kind of becoming their Hello Kitty or their Snoopy or getting that kind of cultural embrace, so. There were a couple things that I wanted to accomplish with Delusionville. I wanted, A, all my own characters so that um, I don't really have any copyright issues anymore. And, and yes, it takes a long time to make people understand who the characters are, but now, you, but they're your characters and they're gonna work for you for the rest of your life. So I don't have to really worry about changing my career again. I get to exploit this, you know, forever. But, but yeah, but the other, other part of Delusionville is, is, is basically it's a fairy tale. And in the fairy tale, all these animals who had a certain status on surface world, when they fall into Delusionville, everything kind of reverses. So the first is the last, the last is the first. The wolves who were once the apex predators and ruled the animal world, um, are now nothing and, and the, the little ducks are more superior than the, it's like Animal Farm, um, but like a new, new take on it. But I, I wanted to talk about um, social class in, in America, which is never even acknowledged. Most people don't acknowledge there's a social class. And also, um, our country's on the verge of a civil war. And, um, and a lot of people can't even talk to each other and they can't, certainly can't talk about ideas uh, of religion or politics. So I thought, well, I'll create all these characters that have all their own politics and all their own religions, and they're not parallel to anything. There's no direct counterpart in our world. So I can talk about the concept of, of tribalism and religion and um, politics without anybody feeling like they're the ones being offended. And uh, so I was looking for that kind of space to talk about big ideas without anybody feeling like, well, you're kind of taking a dump on me right now, you know? So that was a lot of the impetus behind creating this world. Uh, I think a lot about the person that's going to live with the paintings and I want, I mean it's great to have the initial impact that gets you excited in the gallery and at the opening and but also like once it's in your house I, I love that that there's other things to experience and you, maybe you feel a little different about it every day or maybe you notice something different or so it keeps it keeps informing you or, or keeps living with you and giving you more instead of being static. 